America's Heartland is made possible by the American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture, dedicated to building greater awareness and understanding of agriculture through education and engagement. More information at agfoundation.org. Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. The United Soybean Board, whose Common Ground program creates conversations to help consumers get the facts about farming and food. There's more at findourcommonground.com. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KBIE to support America's heartland programming. Contributors include the following. Hey, you think farm equipment is big these days? Check out this baby from 1906. Hi, I'm Jason Schultz. Coming up, I'll show you how they're honoring farm equipment from the past. Hi, I'm Kristen Samos. Farmers have long played an important role in helping develop new crops that affect the food on your dinner table. We'll take you to Montana where one farmer has his eye on helping to develop a new type of oat. Hi, I'm Sharon Vaknin. Walnuts have been popular for centuries, and today we'll crack open some recipes you'll want to try at home. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. We're heading to Arizona this time to meet a chili farmer whose future is focused on some hot and spicy produce. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's Heartland, living close. In America's heartland, living close, close to the land. As farms across the heartland have gotten larger and more productive, the equipment that they've used is modernized as well. We're talking about GPS technology, so they know where to plant their seeds and spray their crops. But you know what? There's still a lot of that old equipment around, some of it's steam powered. You won't find it much in the fields anymore, but you will see it being honored at places like this here in Woodland, California. On a hot afternoon, in a dusty Northern California field. The sound of steam engines, the smoke from wood-burning fireboxes. The tractors that helped farmers break this soil more than 100 years ago are back. And the best show, harvest spectacular. Dozens of antique tractor aficionados are on hand to get hands-on with these restored machines. What's called the best show after the best tractor, which is an early California tractor company, which was uh, formed by C.L. Best. The development of steam-powered mechanical harvest equipment in the 1800s revolutionized agriculture, but the giant heavy equipment would get stuck in California's soft ground. Clarence Leo Best's tractor designs helped to deal with the problem. At today's tractor show, one of Best's early tractors stands out high above the horizon. How high up in the air are we right now, Dean? 15 feet at about this level. 15 feet in the air. I mean, it's a nice view up here. It is. You know, it's funny, people think about old tractors being small, you know, and the new equipment that they've got now being big, but this is from what year? This is 1906. 1906. 1906. What would they have used this for back then? Here in this part of the country, this was built with these big wheels specifically for the soft ground around Stockton and around this part of the country, specifically. Did it work well for them? It did. They sold a lot of these. They sold a little over, close to 300, I think, total running, which was a good run for an engine like this. Best went on to perfect the track-based tractor using tracks instead of wheels. After 15 years in business, he joined with the Holt Manufacturing Company to become Caterpillar. And you see that track design in use today on earth-moving equipment around the globe. While best designs are the highlight, there are many other tractors on display here today. I'm a tractor driving man. If I'm bragging, don't mind me. When you're looking for me, 
In that tall seat you'll find me. Dick Venerbeck brought his 1917 Case tractor. It's being used today to demonstrate grain thrashing. It's steam powered, we're burning wood. Uh, today we're burning incense cedar because it smells nice and it, and it burns quickly. Uh, we need to make a lot of energy. We're, we're, we're turning a lot of water into steam to run this engine. It's a 11 inch piston and an 11 inch bore right here behind us, right? That's amazing. 75 horsepower, one cylinder. And so what's going on down there? Right now we've harvested the field and we've stacked the grain in shocks in a pile and the, the shocks are being thrown into a thing called a thrasher. And the thrasher separates them and takes the heads of the grain off. These are the heads of the, of the grain. They get thrown into this machine behind me and it separates these and... Oh wow, look at that. And there's the grain. There it is. Today's festivities are really a celebration of just how much tractors and harvesters revolutionized agriculture. And to get an idea of just how tough it was before these big wheeled beasts were around, a 30 mule team is on hand to demonstrate harvesting. And it doesn't take long to realize just how challenging it was. For us to have the future, we must restore the past. We must pass it on. We need to know how a loaf of bread is made and how arduous it was. It's so much history here. Oh, today. it's really wonderful, isn't it? Uh, sometimes I think I was born 100 years too late. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a semi-retired semiconductor executive, and I'm, I'm reverting to my hobby to have you fun. Love it. I do. I go one extreme to the other. This is the way I used to decompress. Oh, wow. And this is, you know, it's really fun. It's quite a hobby. It really is. It's the world's heaviest hobby. <laughs> Tractors dramatically changed farming around the world. A century back, it would take a farmer with two horses more than 15 days to plow 40 acres. When tractors arrived on the scene, that same 40 acres could be plowed in a day. And remember that horses had to be fed, meaning some of the farmer's tillable soil would be used to grow feed for the animals. Do you like to try new things? Hundreds of new food products have made their way onto your supermarket shelves in the last 20 years, and farmers continue to work with researchers on even more. Consider oats. They've been around for centuries, but one farmer sees an opportunity for something different. It's harvest time for Bruce Wright on his family farm in Bozeman, Montana. We grow some wheat and barley and hay and peas and some sunflowers, and then a specialty oat that we're working on. That specialty oat now covers 150 acres of land here. And for a farm with roots dating back to the 1800s, that oat is changing the future for this farmer and for thousands of people who suffer from gluten sensitivity. The oats are special because they are a variety that was developed by Montana State University. And what we found in these oats is that they are a hullless variety of oat and they're very low in allergens. And oats in general don't have any gluten in them, so we can take these oats and process these oats and make them into oatmeal and porridge and flour and stuff that can be eaten by people who have gluten sensitivities. Gluten is a natural protein composite found in grains like wheat, barley, and rye. It gives texture and elasticity to dough. It's also used as a flavor enhancer and thickener, which means you'll find it in everything from soups to salad dressings. Gluten-free labeling on products at the supermarket is important for those suffering from celiac disease, which is associated with intolerance to gluten in grains. The demand is growing because the awareness of celiac disease and gluten intolerance is growing. Now the doctors are becoming more aware of celiac disease, gluten intolerance, so it's becoming more diagnosed and more people are paying attention. Producing this product is high tech, high cost, and high science. The combines used to harvest these oats won't be used for other crops for fear of cross-contamination. The oats are hauled to a processing plant to pass through a series of cleanings and crushings. From there it goes into the second cleaner, does more of the same thing, cleans it out 
goes from that second screening machine into a series of stacked indent cleaners. Then it goes up into the roller mill. That's what takes and, and rolls the oat into a flake and what we usually call oatmeal. Bruce's oat production spun off earlier research at Montana State University. Bruce and several other farmers, including Dean Miller and Gary Iverson, make up the Montana gluten-free processors. Their focus is to provide specialized crops for gluten-free products to meet an increasing demand from consumers. These are your short oats. These are the ones we want. And you haven't seen these before in the field. So Dr. David Sands has been working with Bruce on food production for the past eight years. How important are farmers in, in getting new products like this to the market? Well, if they don't grow it, it won't happen. So you have to produce a crop that they want to grow, that uh, makes a difference in, in their income. And also, they are growing food crops. They are as interested in the human consumer as anybody else. What they're interested in is if different varieties of the camel... Laboratory work at Montana State University centers on testing oat varieties. The overall goal is to make a more perfect food, a food that is designed around our genomes. And our genomes are different, so you're going to have these different groups of people wanting different things. And why shouldn't they, and why shouldn't we produce exactly what they want? And for those consumers wanting gluten-free blueberry pancakes, Bruce and others can stop by Bozeman's Main Street Over Easy restaurant. Is there anything else I can grab for you guys? I'm well, how are you? It is really gratifying. When you talk to somebody who hasn't been able to eat a, a bread or something like that, they, they are so happy to be able to have that again. They really, really appreciate their food. I love what I do. I love being able to grow things. I love to be out here in the countryside uh, in the beautiful scenery, one of the most beautiful spots. I, I'm so lucky to get to work here. It's easy to get out into the wide open spaces in Montana. The majority of the state's counties have six or fewer people per square mile. And while you'll find plenty of buffalo, elk, and antelope in Montana, you'll also find a bird associated with the ocean. Montana is home to thousands of white pelicans who make their summer home in Medicine Lake. Hi, I'm Sharon Vagnon. Still ahead, we'll take you from farm to fork with something wonderful using walnuts. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. Still ahead, we'll turn up the heat on your taste buds with a stop at an Arizona farm whose produce could definitely be called hot and spicy. Hi, my name is Tim McConville, and I have a question about agriculture. I hear a lot about sugar in our diets these days, but I don't really know much about sugar and where it comes from and whether it's the same type of sweetener in everything that I eat and drink. There's no doubt that most of us like a little sweetness in our lives. And whether you're having a piece of birthday cake or enjoying a soft drink, you may be wondering just what makes it taste so good. Well, it all goes back to the plant kingdom and farming around the world. Ready for a little chemistry? Sugar is a simple, edible, crystalline carbohydrate. Sugar comes in many different forms, and all of them have a sweet flavor. Way back when, folks used things like honey and maple syrup as sweeteners, but sugarcane is a major source of sugar that we see in the world today. But what else is sweetening those foods on my table? Well, sugar beets are big business for farmers in the upper Midwest in California. The beets are sliced, then processed to extract their sugary content. So now you have your sugar beets, sugar cane, and we should mention corn. That's because a lot of sweetness comes from high fructose corn syrup these days. If there's a sugary taste to your soft drinks, ice cream, breads, or salad dressing, high fructose corn syrup may be the reason. It's also a new player to the sweetness game. With cornstarch as a base, the chemistry was developed in the 1950s, and by the 1970s, it was showing up in lots of things on the supermarket shelf.
Walnuts are for more than just a midday snack. Debbie, tell me about your walnut farm. About 10 years ago, my husband and I were looking for a place that had a little more property for our four children to run and play. We found this nice piece of five acres, but it came with a walnut orchard. So tell me what the process is like for growing walnuts. The trees blossom in the spring, and then we water once a week for a whole year. Come October time, we um, shake the trees, and the walnuts fall down, and then we air blow them all into big rows and pick them up, and we take them to a walnut processor, and then he dries them for about two days at a controlled temperature, and we shell all our walnuts for the whole season. Well, I see some really good looking walnuts right here. So today I'll make a parsley walnut pesto served on chicken kebabs. Ooh, sounds uh. wonderful. <laughs> what are you making? I'm gonna make our family's traditional Anderson family walnuts. Let's do it. So the first thing to make Anderson family walnuts is we're gonna put butter in a pan. Brown sugar. And of course, I'm gonna have you add in the light corn syrup. Then I'm gonna add in just a tiny bit of salt and cream of tartar. Okay, so now we're gonna take it over to the stove. So Sharon, you wanna go ahead and stir that? Oh, it's gonna take just a moment. We need to let right. the butter melt. You can see here that it's starting to boil and I can already feel it thickening. But we're gonna set it to the side and this is baking soda and this is a really important ingredient. What does that do for us? It's actually gonna help it stick to the walnuts. Mm. Okay, Sharon, here's four cups of walnuts. Would you dump it into this bowl? Yeah. Now, one of the tricks or secrets is I use a plastic bowl because if I use a metal bowl, the caramel heat goes away too fast. This is the action part. I have to stir yeah, as fast as I can going for and it. coat it because okay. I only have less than a minute before the caramel will start to set. Now the walnuts are all ready to go. I'm gonna dump them on the cookie sheet. So here's a, a trick. I always kind of do this little chopping motion with a little chop, 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 because I want to spread it out. And we're going to put it in the oven. You're ready for this? Yeah. For two hours. So it's only at 200 degrees, so it's really low. To yeah. intensify the flavor of the walnut. Oh, yeah. Nice. All right, now let's make our chicken kebabs with the parsley walnut pesto. All right. Okay, so these are two chicken breasts, about a pound. Go ahead and cube them and then skewer them for me. I'll go ahead and start on the pesto. You can just run your knife backwards on the bunch and the leaves will come right off. Into the food processor, the parsley goes. Now, my secret ingredient, mint. Oh. Mint pairs very well with chicken. So I just take a bunch of mint, throw it in there. And of course we have our walnuts, our star ingredient. This is just over a cup. Now I'll take the juice of a lemon and a half. We'll add Romano cheese. You can also do Parmesan here. A couple cloves of garlic, salt, and pulse a little bit, then I'll drizzle in the olive oil. Our pesto is ready. Before these go into the oven, we just have to dress the chickens. We'll just drizzle a little olive oil. Ooh. Oh, that looks then, good. And then go ahead and massage it with your hands so that they're fully coated. We'll hit it with some salt. Hit it with some pepper. Finally, Paprika. So let's put this under the broiler on high and we'll flip it once until it's thoroughly cooked. All right, Debbie, we have our walnut pesto chicken skewers and we put your caramel walnuts on a beautiful salad. So what do you say we dig in? I think so. Okay. One of the great things about the walnuts in the salad is that the dressing wets the uh, caramel and it, it tastes the caramel on the lettuce. Oh, and You're it You're gonna really enjoy bit. it. Mmm, mm -hmm. delicious. I could really taste the walnuts. Great compliment to the chicken. And they go surprisingly well with the mint, right? Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going for the salad. That is good. It is. Those caramel walnuts can be addictive. We have definitely proven that these guys are more than just a midday snack. They definitely are.
When it comes to nutritional nuts, you can't do much better than walnuts. High in vitamins and minerals, they are also a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. And walnuts are rich in phytochemicals, delivering antioxidant benefits essential to a heart-healthy diet. Almost any food survey these days will confirm we're adding more spice to our diets. Take a look at the rising popularity of food from Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America. Chili plays a role in all of those cuisines. In Arizona, it's a hot crop for one farm family. Manuel, este le caen es otro es chile, ¿verdad? El otro es el it's a warm afternoon in the arid desert landscape of Arizona. But here on Ed Curry's farm, it's always chilly. Ed spends a lot of time in what you might call heated conversation with his workers. Together, they're carefully tending long rows of chili plants with a single goal in mind, creating the perfect pepper. It's a very tedious, slow process, the breeding, uh -huh. but it's also very, very rewarding because it's our babies. Those babies include more than 200 acres of chili peppers of all kinds. Ed's parents started the farm in 1957. He spent more than three decades carefully pollinating and crossbreeding peppers. My dad taught me the beauty of farming and, and the love for it and doing a good job. My mom taught me the side of of always improving something and always trying to make it better. Today, Ed's helping cover these plants with a fine mesh to make sure his careful pollination efforts aren't diluted by a random bee or butterfly. The careful science and hard work seem to be paying off. A significant portion of all the chilies grown in the U.S. can trace their spicy roots back to Ed's farm. I always kind of lean to making sure that we do things that give our growers really good yields where they can be profitable. But ultimately, it's all based around, are we given a flavor? We still do everything a little bit by hand in that, that we see the chili, we smell the chili, we taste the chili all the time. That flavor is what appeals to Jeannie Neubauer. She's the owner of Santa Cruz Chili and Spice Company. It was started by her father 70 years ago. As her business grew, she went looking for a place to build a bigger factory. She says Ed had a hot idea. Build the plant right in the middle of his chili field. Each year, she uses more than a half million pounds of just picked peppers to make chili paste and other products. What people expect from Santa Cruz chili paste is a consistent flavor, a consistent color, and a consistent heat level. And he's always been able to provide that for me. Speaking of heat, Ed's happy to roast up some peppers and fire up a recipe. In this case, cheese filled chili rellenos. And maybe he'll show you the biggest green chili pepper on earth. This bad boy weighs two thirds of a pound. Will you ever eat no, it? No, it's a trophy. <laughs> <laughs> a certified Guinness World Record. This is scotch bonnet or habanero. Mm -hmm. This is a Thai pepper, very hot. This is a cascabella, some of them call them yellow hots. This is a fresno, red jalapeno hot. This is a serrano. This is ancho. This is jalapeno. Walk the fields with Ed, and you'll learn that it's not the chili seeds that create the heat. It's the oil inside the plant, called capsaicin. So this oil right here, and we judge how hot a pepper is by how far down it goes. Even after 30 years, Ed says this vast landscape and fertile soil continue to fire his imagination and keep his enthusiasm running at a fever pitch. It's been a real blessing to be involved in something that you could change in industry. I feel like for the most part, we've been able to help our fellow man. And at the end of the day, isn't that what it's about? That's going to wrap it up for this time. We're glad that you could come along to discover interesting people and places in America's heartland. 
And remember, you can stay in touch with us 24-7. We make it easy for you. You'll find us on all of your favorite sites, and you can access stories and video from any of our shows at our website, americasheartland.org. We'll see you next time right here on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland, living close to the land There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand In America's heartland, living close, close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by the American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture, dedicated to building greater awareness and understanding of agriculture through education and engagement. More information at agfoundation.org. Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. The United Soybean Board, whose Common Ground program creates conversations to help consumers get the facts about farming and food. There's more at findourcommonground.com. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's Heartland programming. Contributors include the following.